Hello, so I just want to go over our slide lecture together a little bit for this week. Let's see if I can do that. Um, so this is Art 115. We've got a collage by Fred Tomaselli, super psychedelic. Um, this week I want you to think about what is art? How do you personally define it? What are the kind of requirements or set of characteristics needed for something to become art? And then I think really critically, who decides what is art? Is it museums, galleries, art historians, collectors, critics? Is it the artists themselves or is it the viewers? And how might our cultural context and the moment in history change that information? So one artist that I wanted to bring to your attention is Marcel Duchamp. And um, we in the arts really are familiar with this piece right here called The Fountain. Um, and <laughs> it's really got a wonderful story, which is that when Duchamp uh, was a relatively young artist, there, was, uh, there were a lot of restrictions about what could be shown in an art gallery. And there was a group that got together and they were like, no, we're gonna be different. We're going to really let any kind of artist, any kind of art be shown. And so Duchamp took it really seriously and he created this piece called The Fountain and he signed it with a false name, R. Mutt, and he submitted it. And you can guess what happened. Do you think it got in? Do you think it didn't get in? Um, they totally rejected it. And they were just like, this is an art. This is an art, you know, like um, it's possible that, you know, they were offended by the idea that the fountain is in essence, somebody peeing. Like, um, of course, people weren't actually peeing into this in the, in the gallery space, but um, they could also have been offended that he didn't make it. It was an object that already existed, but by signing his name to it, he made it into an art piece. Um, and he was really interested, I think, in art for art's sake. So when we look at this sculpture, this definitely does not form any kind of use. In fact, it defies use, um, the bicycle wheel. Um, the thing that you want to sit on is uh, occupied by the wheel and the wheel that you hope would get you somewhere is occupied with a stool attached. So Duchamp is a really uh, a big game changer in art because he uh, draws attention to um, the fact that there's no single set of qualifications that make something art, but rather that it's the uh, intention of the artist and the idea which drives the work. Um, and I think he really did care about testing boundaries. We could also refer to him as a conceptual artist. So they don't care much about beauty, they actually value ideas. So conceptual art encourages a shift in emphasis away from the object itself and asks us to examine our interpretation of it. There's still lots of people who are super angry when they see this, but I don't know, I think he had a sense of humor and, and we'll leave it at that. So appropriation is when we take something for one's own use, typically without the owner's permission. So it's to adopt, borrow, or recycle, or sample elements of visual culture. We're gonna do a lot of collage in this class, and I think you will find that when we're working with magazine, we're always sampling elements of visual culture. Um, inherent in our understanding of appropriation is that the concept, uh, is the concept that the new work recontextualizes whatever it borrows. This is how it differs from copying someone else's work or stealing intellectual property. So by taking something into a new context, uh -oh. so by taking something into a new context, we make it our own. So recontextualizing, of course, it's placing something um, in a new or unfamiliar context in order to suggest a different interpretation. 
So when <laughs> Duchamp recontextualizes that urinal, which is something that we would find in a restroom, and he puts it in an art gallery, it causes us to think about it differently. And we should be mindful that context is the set of circumstances, the environments, or facts that are surround a particular event, situation, or artwork. So one thing that I've been um, really looking forward to sharing with you, but I'm going to have to minimize it so that you can see the whole thing, is this incredible artwork by Hank Willis Thomas. Um, and so I think he uses appropriation in a really powerful way to question power, history, and who benefits from capitalism. So very often when we're in class, I ask who recognizes this ad campaign? And usually someone's like, whoa, it looks just like the absolute vodka ad campaign. Um, and indeed, so Hank Willis Thomas has taken that uh, kind of bottle outline and their text. Only what we see here is when we look further in the shape of the bottle has been transformed into the belly of a ship. And we see a historic illustration or what looks like a historic illustration of the way that human bodies, the human or the slaves were laid into the slave ships. And it always made me really nauseous to look at these because we can see how closely the bodies are packed and how terrifying that experience must have been. And of course there was the high loss of life um, aboard those ships because of the, I mean, it's just like inhumane really isn't even a word that would allow us to adequately reflect the conditions. Um, and so Hank Willis Thomas is very interesting in the sense that I think he's asking us, um, is history really in the past? What ways does it reach us in the present? And how, um, do folks uh, within marginalized communities and what ways might they be exploited by advertising and capitalism. He had an amazing show at the Portland Art Museum. And if you want to check out more of his work, I have the link for you. Um, okay, so let's keep scrolling down. So this week, I just want to bring to your attention that there are two types of meaning. So if we're if I say apple, there's denotative meaning, which is literal meaning. It's what the dictionary says. And then there's connotative meaning. So that's the implications, the suggestions, or associations beyond the literal meaning. So just to see what this would look like. Um, for apple, the denotative meaning would be the round fruit of a tree of the rose family, which typically has a thin red or green skin and crisp flesh. Many varieties have been developed as dessert or cooking fruit or for making cider. Um, so the denotative meaning is not likely to change. However, connotation could include things like apples are for good health. Apples freshen the breath. They could be made for make juice or cider. Um, maybe you have the idea that uh, people, small school children, bring apples to their teachers. Um, just that it's a type of fruit, that you can make a pie. Um, you might think about technology, like the company Apple. Um, you could be thinking about colors, you could be thinking about original sin, Adam and Eve, and the Bible, and there's probably actually a lot more things that I didn't list. So connotation depends on the people, our experiences, and our culture. Um, because chances are, if I asked this question in a place where apples were not common, maybe there would be a completely different set of connotations. Um, so I've been really excited to show this to you. This piece is called Papa's Last Party. And um, you can tell that it has this nice radial composition where it comes out from the center. And we can see that it's got some really high key colors, um, lots of like little dots, and it just feels very, very expressive. Like it's sort of exploding out. Um, this painting is actually made with neckties. 
So it is a form of collage as well. Um, sort of knowing something about the uh, title and then the neckties might lead us to more of that connotative meaning. When I've talked about this with students before, some of them say, oh, maybe he's retiring, you know, like he doesn't have to wear these neckties to work. Or maybe it's just about like a big party, you know, where like everyone's dressing up. And then also sometimes we say, oh, maybe this is about a funeral or a death because um, we dress in a formal way when we go to funerals. And then the thing about the last party. So again, it depends on us to kind of uh, pull out that connotative meaning. And then finally, we might have an association with this sort of like going towards the light thing, which is like a concept in our contemporary media that that goes around death or the unknown. So this week, we really want to make sure I really want to make sure that you have a strong grasp on what is representational. Um, and so representational artwork is where you look at things and you recognize them. So it might have a person, a squirrel, a like pebble, <laughs> you know, it's just things where you can look at it and you're like, oh yeah, that's a lamp. Like I get it. Like, and figurative um, can sometimes refer to artworks that showcase the human body. So for example, the Fred Tomaselli collage earlier um, that we looked at at the very first slide is figurative because it's got a body and it also has forms that are recognizable like arms and flowers and so on. And abstract art is art that does not depict recognizable imagery. It's non-representational and non-figurative. So this piece by Jackson Pollock is actually a perfect example of abstraction because we might see things in these wild gestures, but we can't actually say, oh yes, Jackson Pollock was drawing like a chihuahua in here. You know, there's nothing that we, our mind may form associations, but it is completely abstract. Um, and I just want you to see this installation shot because you can see how big it is. All right, this is a piece by Gerhard Richter. It's 256 colors. And it's so weird because at first I look at it and I'm like kind of annoyed. It reminds me of paint samples. But then the longer I look at it, I start to see the way that like the dark colors and the vibrant colors make my eyes move around. There's feels like there's some strong diagonals for me. You all will have to let me know what you're seeing when you're looking at this. And this again is really big. So we can get the idea that if we stood in front of it, we would be really immersed by it. Um, this <laughs> incredible uh, icon from the 1400s is an example of representation, right? We can look at it and we recognize a person and we recognize hands and clothing and so forth. Um, I don't know if this is a palm or like a big feather, but I should do some more research to figure that out. I only know about the eyes, which would indicate if we were uh, Catholics in the 1400s, we would have seen it and we would have been like, oh, she's holding eyes. This means that it is Saint Lucy. Um, so iconography is a branch of art history that studies the identification, description, and interpretation of the content of images. So sort of what we were talking about before, like when uh, we were talking about the two types of meaning, genotative and connotative, iconography explores um, literally sort of image writing. So what is laid out by the artist? And so you can tell that this artwork is really different from those abstract pieces we were looking at before, mostly because of its purpose, right? It's meant to be religious in nature. It is meant to be representative. Um, we can see this ornate halo back here in the gold. Um, it just was a really different set of circumstances. Uh, okay, so we talked about that being representational. I also want to introduce you to the concept of the picture plane. 
which is an imaginary plane that is correspondent with the physical surface of a drawing or painting. So in this one, the picture plane is a surface. I feel like I can't visually enter into the uh, picture plane. But here, my eyes go deep because of these perspective lines and I'm able to enter the space. This is by Sarah Morris. Did I make that up? No, nope, Sarah Morris. And so you can see these um, examples of about how big her work is. All right. So when you look at this, I want you to just say, like, what are you noticing? Uh, how does it how does it make you feel? Does it seem messy? Uh, how's the image composed? Um, and remember that composition is the placement and use of art elements like line, shape, color, texture, uh, form, and space. So this piece is actually called Love Joy, and it's by Mary Heilman. It uses super vibrant colors, super high key colors that are contrasted with black rectilinear lines. Um, it feels like it goes beyond the frame because the colors are continuous going out. Um, I can see some brush strokes in here. I can also see drips. Um, it definitely embraces a messy aesthetic. Um, and I'm really excited to show you this because I feel like you might be surprised about where Mary Heilman draws some of her inspiration from. What? <laughs> okay, so Mary Heilman is somebody who just allows herself to reference popular culture, cartoons, family, art history, abstraction, representation, and just, just about everything. Um, there used to be a real hierarchy of, of what uh, should be uh, referenced when you think about religious art or history painting, but in contemporary art, which just means what's happening right now, that hierarchy is really gone. Um, we can see Mary Heilman here uh, with her work installed in a museum and gallery space. And so she makes chairs, she makes paintings, she makes ceramics. It's like pretty much nothing that Mary Heilman doesn't make furniture. And she puts them together into these kind of uh, wonderful interdisciplinary um, installations. Um, I think that her aesthetic uh, is very colorful and funky, kind of chunky, DIY. I also think she has a sense of humor. I can tell by like the fact that she seated herself on this tiny chair. Um, so just for the purposes of this class, aesthetic means the guiding, guiding set of principles or underlining ideas, sorry, underlining, underlying ideas that guide an artist's choices. So here's one of her paintings again. And you can just tell like, okay, like we can see some of those drips that we've uh, started to associate with her. And it's pretty minimalist, right? There's just these, uh, these rectangles and, and the black. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you have an idea of like what era you might associate this color combination with? So it's kind of crazy to me because here we're looking at a much older advertisement. And then for those of us who have a little love of the 80s, um, we see that this color combination comes back again. Um, and But that all of that kind of is built on something that's connotative, like a vague feeling that I'm like, oh yeah, that feels 50s or 80s. And it's built on the things that I've experienced or the things that I've seen. Um, here's a screenshot of Blue Velvet. So um, this was actually created in 1979 and Mary Heilman has titled it Save the Last Dance for Me. And there you can see it in one of Mary's installations. This week you're going to be making composition collages. Um, they're going to be due on Moodle. There's a spot to turn them in for assignments. You photograph them and then upload them. They'll be due at 10 p.m. The theme this week is ferocious. We're going to be doing one collage a week. Um, 
and you should use one of your three by five cards that are part of your materials and cover the entire surface with colors and shapes that convey the theme. Um, I'm going to ask you that this week your collage will be completely abstract. Um, I have some tips for you there. Really what I need you to know is that there's four categories that I'll use to evaluate your collages. There's thematic success. How well does your collage convey the subject or idea? Can your viewers read your artistic intentions? There's composition. Uh, how you place each element of your collage. Um, can you use line, shape, color, value, texture, form, and space to create something that's visually compelling? Um, there's innovation. Uh, can you make something that defies our thoughts about a particular theme? Can you use your materials in a new way? Um, and the best way to go about innovating, I think, is to consider what the most obvious design solutions are and then try to go beyond them. And I apologize because I also called this number three, but this is number four and it's neatness. Um, do you have a finished feeling when we're looking at the collage? Um, so collage is this really amazing thing because I think it can be really expansive. It uh, describes the technique and resulting work of art in which pieces of paper, photographs, fabric, and other ephemera are arranged and stuck down onto a supporting surface, in our case, a three by five card. Um, and then I've got some really beautiful images here for you of artists who use collage in their work. Mark Bradford takes uh, advertisements from all around his neighborhoods and collages them into his paintings. Um, you can see that this is actually a very large scale work. Fred Tomaselli collages in prescription medication that is expired and makes these wonderful kind of psychedelic designs. I also want you to know the vocab uh, tension which is a balance maintained in an artwork between opposing forces or elements. So in this case, I'm saying there's a tension between the downward fall of the body and then this kind of U-shaped um, web-like structure beneath that supports uh, our eye from going off the page. Here are some examples of installation art by um, Polly Applebaum, who is on our syllabus as well. And you can see on the left hand side, she's used uh, swatches of fabric to create this piece that she calls crazy green bruised orange. And then on the right, she's created a piece called City of Lights. And all of these are made with sequins on the floor. Polly Applebaum makes these incredible, incredible pieces that are physically put into the gallery space and they're not glued down or sewed down. She's just arranging them there. And then when the exhibition is over, she packs them all up and she calls these splats. I want you to see this one. I love this one. Like, oh my gosh, can you imagine being up on the second story of this museum in Spain and getting to look down and see this? It's like so beautiful and crazy. It reminds me of rugs or textiles. Um, also just like um, maybe even like a aerial map of something. Some historical examples of collage from modernism is Hannah Hawk. Uh, Picasso made a lot of collages. You can see it's like wallpaper, uh, music, like maybe a drawing, a little bit of the daily paper. Um, I don't know what that is. I don't know if he made that faux wood or what. Um, and Kirk Schwitters also over here. These are like full actual objects stuck on top of this, right? They're extending out into space. A little bit of burlap. Um, so you can just see that it's like really um, anything goes kind of um, material. So here is our litmus test for abstract or representational. So when you're looking at these and you're asking yourself, 
is this abstract? I mean, it's really weird. It's definitely a departure from reality. But I can recognize a lot of things. I'm like covered bridge, mushroom, flowers, owl, horse, <laughs> pumpkin people. I'm not really sure what's going on there. I'm going to try to zoom. Okay, but we can tell that is not abstract. Whereas this one down here, when I zoom in, I'm like, I think I know what things are. Uh-oh, this one might be busted because I can very clearly see teeth here. But just everything else in the composition, it's all just colors and shapes. And so that would qualify as abstract. Abstract? Uh-oh, not abstract. However, if it was just these colorful forms out here, it could be abstract. Okay. Last thing. I want you using your sketchbook, please, to take notes for class and just doodle. Doodle when you're watching TV, draw when you're waiting for something, do it anytime you want to. Um, you can also use it to outline your ideas for collages, to write or experiment with different materials. Um, I love this piece like because I'm like, oh, look, like you can do all this crazy visual brainstorming by mapping. Please, if you want to do that in your sketchbook, do. Sketchbooks are a good way to like sort yourself out before you start working on the project. So you can do a lot of different versions of things and figure out what you actually like best. You can see all these different experiments. I also think like if you're having trouble getting started, there's no pressure to be perfect. And you can just start with like lines and textures. And it's pretty amazing how even the simplest doodles will start to develop your own visual voice. I love this mayhem. So I don't want you to ever feel pressure to make something that's really finished. You can if you want to, but they can also be just like crazy. Thank you so much for listening to today's design lecture. And I look forward to talking with you next week.